Greetings. Welcome, wherever you are. I'm glad you're here. We pray for Ukraine that its people may know peace. The title of my talk is Diamond's Panorama Picture. This Diamond is the late Diamond Katagiri Roshi, who was my teacher and the founder of this center and Hokioji. The topic is right view, the first step on the Buddha's Eightfold Noble Path that relieves suffering. Right view is seeing each moment or thing as it is, rather than through the filter of our conceptions. We all have our own way of seeing the world. It's our perspective on things and also the, our perception, the way we see things. It may be subconscious, but it influences everything we say or do or think. So the Buddha started there. So probably this will sound strange, but the seed of this talk was planted late last summer when I was watching a live stream broadcast of La Vuelta a España. And that is one of the grand tours of bicycle racing. It's a three week event, like the Tour de France. It travels 2000 miles through Spain and it's gorgeous. So one of the joys of watching is the awe-inspiring video that is broadcast from helicopters that are covering the race. And they also take you to nearby points of interest and broadcast beautiful scenarios. Many people watch this just for the armchair travel, which I may be somewhat guilty of. <laughs> Although I've learned to appreciate the rest of it as well. Sometimes you'll see these glorious vistas and down below you see the massed group of riders in the peloton and they're they're just moving along and shifting and changing shape just like they're a living organism. And the helicopters are also constantly moving. So nothing is ever still or static. Everything is in constant motion. And when you watch it live, like I try to do, it's on in the morning, early morning usually, there's an added immediacy and vibrancy to the whole experience. Seeing so much life, beauty and motion often gives me a feeling of expansion, happiness and contentment. In a way, I have experience, an experience of forgetting myself while I'm watching. I thought about how many points of interest are high places. And I reflected on how it is that humans are attracted to places where we can get a broad point of view. We look out from mountains, cliffs, observation decks, scenic overlooks, castle turrets, lighthouses and towers of all kinds gliders, drones, satellites, and space telescopes, and we gaze in awe. Perhaps we are attracted to high places because we innately enjoy seeing from a broader point of view. We yearn to see the world and know where we are so we can know who we are. The spiritual path is also like this. While watching the bicycle race and thrilling to the extraordinary aerial views of the landscape, I thought of Katagiri Roshi's term, panorama picture. So I went back to his books and I realized that he was talking about right view. Right view is a translation of the Pali language term, sama dithi, D-I-T-T-H-I which may also be translated as right seeing, 
right vision or right understanding. Every step on the Eightfold Path begins with Sama, which is usually translated as right. And that right sometimes gives us a lot of confusion and understanding what do they mean by right. So Sama, right, is a rich word similar to summa in Latin. It conveys a sense of completeness or perfection in the sense of fulfillment. Perhaps it's like reaching the other shore at the end of the spiritual quest and experiencing freedom from suffering. Buddha's path is often depicted by an image of a wheel called the Dharma Chakra. Sometimes it looks like the ship's wheel that a captain uses to set the direction in which the boat will go. In that sense, Sama is the right direction to go to reach the other shore. So here is Katagiri Roshi's teaching. Uh, for, you, for those of you in the room here, it is on your program, so you can, you can read a line, but the people I, on internet don't have this, so uh, I'm going to read it. Uh, when you hear it, um, you might think that um, he's giving us a way to consider right view from three aspects, everyday life, spiritual truth, and the harmony between them. When you start to practice Zazen, you will see a panorama picture of your life running through your head from the past to the present to the future. You may enjoy what you see or be disappointed when you see the unwholesome aspects of your life. If you watch that panorama with some expectation, you just get exhausted. But that panorama is right in the middle of the vastness of the universe. With the frontal lobe of human knowledge, you don't believe this because human knowledge cannot see the panorama picture of your life working with all sentient beings. Through spiritual practice, you can go beyond human knowledge to directly touch the life of nature, the life of the sun, and the life, the real life of human beings. When you see the panorama picture of your life interconnected and interpenetrated with every being, beyond races and cultures, you see yourself arrayed in the whole world. Then immediately there is spiritual communion between the universe and you, Buddha and you, others and you. You get into nature's life, nature comes into your life, and there is communion. At that time, you discover your true self. So as a side note, um, this, this compilation is, uh, this, this, what I read is a compilation of uh, excerpts from, from his two most recent books, uh, Each Moment is the Universe and the Light that Shines Through Infinity. So you, you can't go to some book and see it exactly like this, but all the words came from his books. Um, and if you read Each Moment is the Universe, which is the first of the two, you will see this term as panoramic picture. Uh, I think Katagiri always said panora panorama picture, but the publisher wouldn't allow a term that was, in, that was grammatically incorrect. Uh, but to me, panorama picture feels dynamic and panoramic picture feels static. So if you read it, please think of this panoramic picture as a sweeping video, uh, not as something pasted in a photo album. So the first panorama that Katagiri mentions is the panorama picture of our life running through our head from the past through the present to the future. 
we always see that when we start to practice as in. So we all know, we all know that endlessly streaming show. It emerges from some inner program that our ego uses to process and sort all the things that we see, think, and feel into some kind of narrative story that makes sense to us. Sometimes that story triggers suffering, anger, anxiety, and regret. But it's always very kindly <laughs> letting us see the way our minds really work. And that gives us a chance to study and reflect on ourselves and refine our inner program. When we use Buddhist teachings to examine ourselves honestly, to refine our theory of life thoughtfully and try to live it sincerely. That is seeing through the lens of Dharma in everyday life. So that is one way we can understand right view. To me, it's important to notice that Katagiri doesn't dismiss the narrative running through our head as unimportant. He puts it in a larger context that includes it. He says that panorama is right in the middle of the vastness of the universe. So that leads to another way of understanding right view. In the second paragraph, Katagiri says, through spiritual practice, you can go beyond human knowledge to directly touch the life of nature, the life of the sun, and the real life of human beings. This is kind of the mystical playground of Zen. The masters who brought Zen to America in the 20th century liked to talk about seeing in ways that included cosmic perspectives. For example, in each moment is the universe, Katagiri Roshi said. In Buddhist history, the word silence corresponds to right view. Seeing impermanence, the truth that everything is appearing, disappearing, and changing from moment to moment, you can see dynamic activity there, extending in every direction of the world. That means you see the depth of human existence. So this right view is intuitive insight or a way of seeing with the inner eye. It's a state of silence where no words are coming up because the discriminative mind of ego that produces words is silent and still. The physicist Fritjof Capra wrote the 1975 book, The Tao of Physics, an exploration of the parallels between modern physics and Eastern mysticism. It was widely known at the time, maybe still is, I don't know. Um, but it had a really big influence on me early in my spiritual path. I'll always remember the preface to the book where Capra wrote, and I've abridged it a little bit for time. I had a beautiful experience which set me on a road that has led to the writing of this book. I was sitting by the ocean one late summer afternoon watching the, way of the waves rolling in and feeling the rhythm of my breathing. When I suddenly became aware of my whole environment as being engaged in a gigantic cosmic dance, I saw cascades of energy coming down from outer space in which particles were created and destroyed in rhythmic pulses. I saw the atoms of the elements and those of my body participating in this cosmic dance of energy. I felt its rhythm and I heard its sound. And at that moment, I knew that this was the dance of Shiva, the Lord of dancers worshiped by the Hindus. Katagiri Roshi was also interested in this book. He referred to what Kapra saw as a continuous stream of life energy 
And he said that in Zen, it is called continuous practice. Uh, recently, I saw something really similar to Capra's statement from Jan Chozen Bai's Roshi. She wrote this in her reflection on case 58 of the, the recently published Hidden Lamp Collection. And I'm gonna read another from her. Zazen allows us to zoom in like a microscope, past skin and hair, sinking into the commonality of bone and flesh, of carbon and hydrogen, all the way down to gluons and quarks, dancing in empty space a field of potential energy filled with forms flashing in and out of existence. Zazen also allows us to zoom out like a telescope past city, nation, planet, and solar system, all the way out to pulsars and black holes dancing in empty space. A field of potential energy filled with form flashing in and out of existence. she goes on, we have been, are, and will be everything. Our practice helps us at last to let go of all differentiation and sit at ease in the humming maw of potential energy we call emptiness. To let go and smile as out of that emptiness arise mischievous goddesses and serious arhats, and you and me. Our usual human minds receive this flowing and generative energy of life through a veil or a filter and process it into the dualistic way of seeing the material reality that is our everyday life. This discriminating function of creating our sense of being separate from the world is, in Buddhist understanding, our original ignorance. If the veil thins or breaks, we see life as it is. There is no separate person who sees and no separate object that is seen. There is just dynamic energy. This direct seeing of emptiness, universal cosmic life, is the second meaning of right view. Seeing truth by seeing without the illusion of separation. The Heart Sutra begins there. It says, Avalokiteshvara, when deeply practicing Prajnaparamita, clearly saw that all five aggregates are empty and thus relieved all suffering. Katagiri Roshi was once asked why we are taught to keep our eyes open in Sazen when most other methods of meditation say to keep your eyes closed. He said, so you can see what's going on there. Another meaning of right view is perfected vision. It's the capacity to see human attachment and suffering in such a profound way that the craving that causes suffering doesn't arise at all. Without the craving that causes suffering, there is freedom from suffering. And the promise of the third noble truth that there is freedom from suffering is fulfilled. As I understand it, in Buddha's first teaching, this is the original meaning of right view. We can think more about this by going back to right view as direct seeing without the veil of a separate self. From the point of view of oneness, all beings are already the contents of your life. Since nothing is separate from you, there's nothing outside of yourself that's available for you to desire. Thus, 
Since desire is not possible, there is no suffering. This is the joy of egolessness, not as loss, but as fullness and satisfaction. But it doesn't end there because seeing that all beings are the contents of your life is the basis for feeling universal love for all beings. Going back to the quote that we're studying here, Katagiri says, when you see the panorama picture of your life interconnected and interpenetrated with every being, there is spiritual communion between the universe and you, Buddha and you, others and you. You get into nature's life, nature comes into your life, and there is communion. So first we talked about everyday human life, then about universal cosmic life. Now both of them appear that they're commingled in a relationship. Dogen calls that relationship Zenki, Z-E-N-K-I, the whole works. It's the third panorama picture seeing the material world of individual beings and the cosmic world of emptiness existing simultaneously and interdependently. When we experience that as our own true self, we receive it as the meaning of life and we feel satisfied. Kadgiri Roshi said, between the source of existence and the phenomenal world, there is no separation. Working together dynamically without creating a gap, that is called harmony. And then in Buddhist terms, this harmony is represented as right. When we see in that way, we become beautiful and warm people, appreciating and helping all beings. So, so those are three ways of understanding right view. You could say it as seeing by theory, seeing by experience, and seeing it by intimacy. So now I want to say something about the right views in a little different way. So um, I recently read an article about luck <laughs> and how to get it. It was illustrated with a huge image of a four leaf clover, which represents the fourth, a, a clover like a shamrock. St. Patrick's Day has three leaves. And if, it, if a clover has four, that's for luck. That's the way I understand it. When I was a little girl, my friends and I would sit on one of our family's lawns and very patiently poke through the leaves of clovers looking for a lucky clover. Um, I don't really know <laughs> what, why we understood it that way, but uh, I guess we thought maybe it would make our lives better somehow. Uh, we never found one. But in this article, psychologist Jacqueline Woolley, she says, People who feel lucky have a broader focus and they're more likely to encounter change opportunities and then good things can happen. On the other hand, people who think of themselves as unlucky are really just sort of stuck in their narrow focus. So Buddhism gives us many lenses, many ways of looking at everyday life from very small to huge. Buddhism, Buddhism explains to us how the lenses work and then Zen, Zen trains us to have a flexible focus. Like a photographer who fra frames and reframes a scene for the best effect, we can choose the frame of our response to circumstances. This is one of the rewards of spiritual practice. Knowing that we have the capacity to see what's going on through the lens of Dharma. And then we may create good causes and conditions for ourselves and others by the way we respond. So we can be lucky. 
When I was studying with Katagiri Roshi, one day I was driving west on I-694 in the Fridley area. I had dropped off the kids and was heading to work. There's a point on the highway where you reach the crest of a hill and a broad landscape opens up for you. I'd seen this many times because it was my commuting route. But on that day, in the moment when that panorama appeared, I was struck by a feeling of awe and my mind stopped for a moment. When my mind came back online, I was filled with a pervasive sense of well being, of having been touched by something bigger than myself. Recently, I've been hearing about a function of the human brain called the default mode network, but it's also called the default neural network, but mostly the DMN. It was first described in 2002 by neuroscientist Marcus Raichle, R-A-I-C-H-L-E, maybe Rachel. Neurologists say this network is about self-focus and mental time travel. It is most active when the brain is in a resting state, not focused on anything. It hijacks the mind to mull over worries and emotions. It means that when the mind has no focus, it tends to ruminate over what happened the day before and what will happen in the days to come. I've been hearing about it because research has found that meditation has the effect of quieting the default mode network. Since the DMN flares up when the brain has nothing better to do, the intentional activity of meditation interrupts that self-centered flow and promotes well-being. The connection between the DMN and the ego is very interesting. In his book, How to Change Your Mind, Michael Pollan refers to this area of the brain as the me network. He says, it appears that when activity in the DMN falls off precipitously, the ego temporarily vanishes and the usual boundaries we experience between self and the world, subject and object, all melt away. Researchers are also finding that any experience of awe, such as hiking to a mountaintop or just being in nature, can take you out of your ego and refocus your attention on the big picture of life. The actor William Shatner, from Star Trek, <laughs> had a dramatic experience of awe last October. During his 10 minute trip beyond the Earth's atmosphere on Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin rocket. When he landed, Shatner was in an altered state of mind. He said, what you have given me is the most profound experience I can imagine. This is what I never expected. It is so, so much larger than me in life. The moment you see the vulnerability of everything, the enormity and the quickness and the suddenness of life and death, everybody in the world, I hope I never recover from this. I hope I can maintain what I feel now. I don't want to lose it. Insight, enlightenment, realization. There are many words pointing to a state of mind when the ego consciousness is quiet. I think our treasured moments of awe are a small taste of what it's like when we're seeing the universal truth. Um, a few months ago, like many people my age, I had cataract surgery. Cataracts are yellowish. So you are always seeing through a filter of yellow. When I saw the true colors 
of things after my surgery. I was shocked. My furniture and clothes, everything looked completely different. Cataract surgery is done in two installments. So there's a time gap when you can see, you can blink back and forth. <laughs> when I looked up at the ceiling through my, my old eye, the ceiling was yellow. And when I looked up at the ceiling through the new eye, the ceiling was white. <laughs> um, but when I looked through both, you know, it was sort of a combination of the two, a blend. And it was harmonious, right? There was no problem there. So I think those three perceptions can be a metaphor for right view. Although I wasn't aware of it, my cataracts gave me a false view of the world, like the veil or the filter of the self-centered discriminating mind that produces our original ignorance. We can study Buddhism as a sort of owner's manual for our life. If we use it to see ourselves clearly and deepen our understanding of how things work, we are practicing right view. When the first cataract was removed, one eye was suddenly seen without a filter and it was a shock. In spiritual life, the state of realizing the truth without the filter is also a shock. It usually happens only when we're well prepared and receptive to it. So with our bodies and minds, we practice being willing to let go of ego and open ourselves to receiving. The third cataract condition was having both eyes open, seeing each differently and together creating a third way of seeing that includes both. This is the realm of harmony. An old Chinese poem that we sometimes chant in Zen is the harmony of difference and unity. It expresses that the relative world <clears throat> and absolute truth exist together and work together in intimate relationship as the reality of life. Dwelling in that sublime harmony is the joy of spiritual practice. So I want to end with some final thoughts, but it takes more than one page. <laughs> My memory of Katagiri Roshi is that he taught Zen with a cool mind and a warm heart. And he always, always stressed the significance of practicing Zazen. Two of his simple practice reminders were Relax your frontal lobe and open your heart. I don't think he ever put them together as one continuous phrase, but I do. <laughs> and um, I think they really work well together. And you can use them anytime, not just on the cushion, but anytime. <clears throat> Relaxing your frontal lobe is cooling your mind by not paying attention to the content of that self-referential panorama flowing through your mind. Instead, you can notice the sensation of tension in your head that creating a thought produces. Imagine that tension dissolving into just energy, the energy of life and tune into it. Sometimes you can even feel, have a sensation of that contracting tension of a thought as it's starting to form. And you can interrupt it and release the tension before it fully emerges. Opening your heart is a way of gathering energy in the center of your chest, feeling its warmth and then letting it spread out radiating inwardly and outwardly. It's a practical way to actively participate in the dynamic universe that includes you. As Katagiri liked to say, let the flower of your life force bloom. 
I found that in the Lakota language, there is the phrase, I think pronounced Chante Ishta. It's spelled C-A-N-T-E-I-S-T-A. -E that means the eye of the heart. The eye of the heart also appears in the Bible. And one of uh, the contemporary or, or contemporary Christian mystics, Cynthia Bourgeau, used it as the title of one of her books. And here's something on seeing from Richard Rohr, a colleague of Bourgeau's at the Center for Action and Contemplation. He's a Franciscan priest who teaches how to see the non-dual perspective that's present in Christian teachings. He says, love is the realm for perfect seeing. When we're in love in agape, we are able to see correctly. When we're reading reality correctly, we will love. We will know how to love. We will be in love. From some place we do not completely understand comes this capacity to forgive to embrace, to compassionately understand, to let go and hand over my small self to the big self that we call God or our higher power. Right seeing, right view is the Buddha's first step on the path because it forms the foundation for all the steps that follow, beginning with right intention. So we study and try to live based on understanding life like this. And that includes seeing how things go astray. Things go astray and we have to think carefully and skillfully about how to respond. So my conclusion, I wish for all of us that we may see with a cool mind and a warm heart and be skillful and helpful in our responses to the world. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? you'd like to share. Hi, this is Katie online. Katie. Um, in the uh, climate change class, we are uh, reading um, Eco Dharma by David Loy. And he talks, th this chapter we just read, he talks about perhaps we should contemplate what if humans go extinct? And I, I think, and he, he talked about having that enough of a panoramic view to view a world where humans no longer exist. And I thought that was fascinating. I mean, how, how much more panoramic can you get where we're, we're not even here anymore? So that was a, a very interesting experience. <laughs> very apropos. Thank you very much, Katie. Andrea, I was really struck and moved by your talk today and thinking about um, just a sense of uh, isolation and claustrophobia the last couple of years and how um, walking in nature um, has just, uh, there's no words for it. It's just, it just changes things um, that, uh, to stay in the house and to have a routine and to have a structure to my life um, uh, could be productive, but um, sterile. And uh, how, how getting outside, feeling cold air on my face, smelling the air and walking on the earth um, I think has been just the most profound thing that's happened in the last couple of years um, and been a great interruption for my um, uh, ongoing worrying mind. So 
I just thank you so much for your talk. Oh, you're welcome, Judy. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, you mentioned sublime harmony of uh, I think it was seeing the camera at you and not in the Chinese proverb. You could explain that a little bit more. Um, do you know the, the harmony of difference in unity, the, the chant? Do you, do you know what I well there is a long um, a long I, I think in, in our chant book, it's probably almost on two pages, is it? Or maybe it's one. It's one page. Okay, it's the other one that's two pages. Yeah. And it's um, it's a poem, and it, um, it just has a lot of really beautiful images in it that kind of move you to not get stuck on either seeing things in a relative way, which is kind of our everyday mind that we're in right now, like, like the dualistic mind. And the other way of seeing the world, which is uh, free from that dualistic separation that we feel. And really, I think that the, if I want to dare say, the goal of Zen practice is to be able to see that third way where you're neither, you're not either one exclusively, but you're a combination of the two, and the two are dynamically your life is alive by having both of those things working together within you and being able to see the world not as separate from you but you as part of the world and that feeling is sublime if, if you experience that feeling there's like absolute contentment so John, you had a question. Um, I just so appreciate that you you use so many sources for quotes in your talk today. Gavigiri and Richard Rohr, Cindy Michelle, the scientist. And, um, to me, that kind of represents panorama, that there are so many places out there that speak the truth. And I think the more that we're open to, to uh, hearing from different denominations, different people, even you know, scientific and uh, spiritualistic. Uh, the more we open up, the more mm -hmm. we can see. Yeah, you know, it's, that's really like seeing through the eyes of Dharma. Like, if you really have the eyes kind of attuned to it, it's, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It doesn't belong just to Zen or Buddhism or Christianity or anything. It's, it's so fundamental to the way we exist. Mm -hmm. And, and that knowing that just enriches uh, our sense of who we are and why we're here and what to do about it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Andrea, it's Jen online. Hey, Jen. Hi. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I really I feel you spoke to my heart today. I, I, I had to grab a uh, paper and just write things down. Um, and, and I can't, of course, say everything that I wrote down, but it just, it, I feel like, uh, like rain in uh, on parched <laughs> earth. I really do. There's so many things that you said, but one of the, th one of the things I just wanted to mention is as I was taking notes, um, and you mentioned uh, Category's first book, <laughs> I heard no kidding. I heard each woman is the universe. <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote down, wait, that's not it, is it? <laughs> so I just really felt like you were speaking to me and, and my heart, and I so appreciate what you said. Thank you very much. Nice to see you, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> um, and thank you. Thank you for oh, you're welcome. Talk this morning and stuff today. Um, I'm not around enough to know much about you or your background or connection that you have to see. Would you say just a bit? Sure. Um, well, I first came here in 1978. Uh, Zen Center um, 
watched him at the end of 72. So I, was, I wasn't one of the first people, but I, um, I, I came then. I had been practicing transcendental meditation pretty seriously for about four years. And then a friend of mine told me about Katagiri Roshi and said, you have to meet him. <laughs> so I made an appointment and came over and met him. And um, he just, um, there was something about him where, you know, I felt like I had found my person, my guru. <laughs> so um, I started coming, I was pregnant at the time. And so, and, and I ended up having three children. So uh, my path through Zen has really been one of someone who was always working, almost always working full time, commuting, raising three children, and going through a lot of ups and downs in life. Um, I think probably the most significant thing I've done is that I edited two books of Katagiri Roshi's teaching. And each one of them took me probably about seven years to do. So those are the two most recent books I edited. And they, that was how I, so well, I, when I knew Katagiri, I knew his heart. And I felt like I had a really profound relationship with him. But like most people, I didn't really understand what his teaching was. One thing he was difficult to understand and his teaching style was um, not tidy. <laughs> I what to say about it. <laughs> but, um, it was wonderful and an immersive experience if you were present, but intellectually it was hard to quite get a handle on it. So I, I edit, editing was kind of my own personal project and it turned, I was able to turn it into books and help me kind of see what it was he saying, what was the actual content of, what was the takeaway? And now I have, um, I have my three children, they're all married. I have five grandchildren. I also have two step children and six step grandchildren. Thank you for the teaching today and talking about silence. I have a question, Andrew, could you repeat the three letters to the neurologist for speaking about, about the brain and pacing yeah. back sort of how the panorama? D, M, N, default mode network. Yeah. And it's, it's function, it, it uses different parts of the brain sort of in synchronicity of some mm -hmm. sort. And it's, kind of all opposite to the task positive network. And, and there are other networks that function in the brain too. Work in manufacturing and um, working in industrial parts, but then um, a lot of times on my lunch break, I'll walk down to the end of the park and then I'll be out in the country, oh. um, which is nice. And what's kind of things I notice is sometimes like more of a panoramic view is like things will be kind of chaotic in the manufacturing plants. And then I'll go out into the country and then like you'll just see like the cattails just sitting there. And, Oh, yeah. back and forth, I like oh. kind of, which is it's great, great to do that. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> like you know, like where my mind was just at. Oh, yeah, right yeah. Now. Uh, I guess it's just a good um, reminder to see something larger. But um, I guess I've kind of struggling to take that what I've seen on the walk and bring it back into the plants and that they're like too different from each other. Oh but then I also yeah. had like the thought of Mahayana that that then samsara is nirvana. So yeah. So, so what do you do with that? Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, kind of yeah. work 
Well, I have two things I wanted to say to you. One is when I was a little girl, very little girl, I remember being out walking with my mother and I saw some cattails and they were like glistening in the sunlight. And it's my first memory is seeing those cattails and how just beautiful they were. It was like, it was like my whole being awakened as a, in, as a human being by seeing those cattails. And the other thing that came up for me was when you're talking about the factory, I started thinking of all the energy in that factory. And I was wondering if you took a step back and you just looked at that factory from, from a broad perspective, all the people and all the energy and all the movement and all the vitality and the life of the machines and the electricity and the hearts and the, all just moving together doing something. I don't know, maybe you could just step back and think of it that way. I'll, I'll give it a try. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to close if, unless anybody wants to sneak in. I'd just like to close with uh, closing. May the marriage of this penetrate into each thing in all places so that we and every sentient being together can realize the Buddha way. Thank you.